You're listening to a message preached from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church, St. Thomas, Ontario. John chapter 10. It's Mother's Day. It's a day dedicated to that special lady chosen by God to bring us into this world. And if your mother's here today, praise the Lord for her, love her. My mom's not here today. I wish her a happy Mother's Day the other day. Unfortunately, my mother does not remember that. And my mother is quickly leaving us, not in body, but in mind. And uh, we sorrow in that, but we still have her, and we praise the Lord for that. Uh, Other than sharing the soul-saving gospel message, being a mother has to be the greatest assignment given to mankind. It is a huge responsibility. Ladies, let me again say how much we appreciate the work that you do and what you give in our lives. It is at best a difficult task. Too many women today have to assume both roles of parenting, and many commendably try very hard and give very much. Brother Yomas, you got to fix this for me. I'm going to go crazy. We don't get that fixed. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm funny that way, folks. I'm sorry. If everything's not just right, I'm never going to go on, all right? Something's not right this morning. I don't know what it is, but it's just a little too hot. I commend you on that. I don't know many men that can do as good a job in that role of parenting or in that in that caring for others like women do. Now, I know men have done it. I know men do a very good job. But the natural role of of raising a child comes through the mother. God made it that way. God assigned it that way. And I'm thankful that he's done that. Most men are not the nurturing kind. We've got some men who have through circumstance help to raise their children or helping to raise their children or spend a good deal of time in raising their children. And thank you for that, guys. We appreciate that. But I don't know any of those guys that wouldn't say, I'd much rather have my wife do that mothering role. Too many women today have to assume both. And that's a sad state of affair. I I have very little, very little for a man that will not help in that, that role of raising a child. Mother in part is defined as a woman exercising control influence, or authority. I want you to know that knowing Jesus makes parenting easier. I started a series a while back on knowing Jesus and how that helps us. I want to show you today that whether you be the mother or the father or the mother and the father, knowing Jesus makes parenting easier. I didn't say easy. I said easier. I believe that to be so because when you boil it all down, parenting is about giving life and providing a life that we hope is even better than our own. My children are here today, and I'm so glad. I I talked with them yesterday. We had lunch together for Mother's Day, and and I said, in light of what's happened to our friend, I am so thankful that our children are saved, that they love the Lord, that they love their parents, that they're living this life and life in an abundance, that they're they're not struggling with some of those things that many struggle with in this world, and I beg them to continue on in that life. My wife has said to many, and I think it's a great statement, that a mother is only as happy as her saddest child. You think about that statement. A mother is only as happy as her saddest child. If your children are happy, it's a good thing for a mother. The Bible talks about that, how as children we can bring a joy to our mother, to our fathers, if we'll simply live a life that's, that brings them joy. And so I want to look at parenting today in the light of Jesus Christ, who brings life and then wants for us to have a better life. As a parent today, I want my kids to have a great life. I had a great life growing up. My parents did a great job of raising us and providing for us. And and, and I want my kids to have even just a little bit more than what my parents were able to give to me. That's a natural desire in the heart of a parent. I I want them to, to experience life and all that there is of life, the good things of life, and to have more of this life. And Jesus Christ, who loves us, gave us life and wants us to have more of life and is provide, providing and, and preparing an even greater life for us in heaven. And so he's a great parent and we can follow his example. It's exactly what Jesus came to do for all of mankind. And as I mentioned this morning in my Vision to Find class, I had the privilege this week of, of uh, going with Brother Yeomans and sitting down at, a, at a, a kitchen table and opening the scriptures and sharing with someone about Jesus Christ. 
And how Jesus Christ came, God's Son, in this flesh. We, we don't have uh, any visual pictures of that. We don't have anything that we can show that. So by faith, we believe that he came, that he died, that he gave his life to pay the penalty of our sins, and that by receiving him, we can have the hope of eternal life. And the dear lady that received Christ as her Savior found a new life that day. Aren't you glad people get saved? Did you say amen to that? I love when people get saved. I love that we're able to lead people to Christ. It's so exciting. We look forward to sharing good things of Christ. I want you to look at John chapter 10, verse 10 with me this morning. It says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. Who is that thief? Oh, that thief is Satan. That thief is the devil. He's rotten. He's no good. I hate him. He has inflicted so much pain on our humanity he has given temptation beyond control to many. I hate him. Someone said the other day, I can't wait to see him in the judgment. I wish I could punch him in the nose myself. I, Jesus Christ will take care of him. Don't worry. He said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more, what? Abundantly. Life abundant. Again, I have a great life, folks. I have to tell you, there's been some heartaches, there's been some sorrows, there's been some trials, difficulties, but, but for the better part, I have had a great life. I've had an abundant life. And many in this auditorium this morning, many that will listen to this message would say, we've had an abundant life. When you look at some others in this world and what they have to endure and what they live in and what little they have, we have an abundant life today. And if you know Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what status you are in this world, you can have an abundant life. If it be not here one day, we will walk a street that is pure gold, there will be a crystal river, there will be a tree of life, there will be mansions that line the sides of the street, and at some point in that city there will be a throne room, and there sits the Father, and at his right hand the Savior, Jesus Christ. And we will leave the sickness and the sorrow and the death and the heartache and all of the things of this world. And we will live in that place and we will see Jesus Christ and we will be a joyous people for eternity. And all God's people said, Amen. I want to explore some of the parallels between the love of Christ for his children and the love of good parents for theirs. I want to show you first of all this morning that good parenting begins with life. Good parenting begins with life. Part of God's genetic code is for a woman to want to give life and to save life. That, that's within you, ladies. I, I don't know many ladies that don't have that. I know some ladies I've met in life said, you know, I, I, I didn't care to have children or, or children were a struggle for them. But for the better part, most ladies grow up as young girls holding those little baby dolls and cuddling them and clothing them and washing them and all the things that little girls do with those dolls. And, and, and they practice that motherhood. They, they watch mom do it. I, I watch as the yeoman's uh, children are now beginning to mother their little sister Zoe. It's neat to see how quickly they want to do that. They want to hold that baby and they learn how to cradle that baby and they want to give the bottle and they want to give the soother and they want to uh, do all the things except change the diapers. I don't know why they don't want to do that, but um, they want to do those other things. And the baby cries and they give them back to mom, right? There's a longing in the heart of most women to have that child, to experience that, that giving of that life. I asked someone the other day, why'd you have your children if you knew they weren't going to be perfect, if you knew that they were going to cause trouble, if you, that you knew they were going to cause a heartache? Why do we have children? We do it because we want to have love and we want to give love. We want to love that, that child unconditionally. We want that child to love us unconditionally. It's just a, a great love between us. And mothers, today you've had a child, I hope and pray, call you or give you something, or, or they will later, or you'll get together, and they'll say, we love you, we appreciate you. And mother's Day, one day a year, no. <laughs> it should be every day. It should be every day. But isn't it nice that we have set aside some time just to say to our mothers, if no other time, we love you today. Can I tell you from experience that you better do it today? Because she might not remember it tomorrow. Let her know every day. Every time I call my mom now, mom, I love you. I don't know if she knows who I am or not sometimes. She, she acts very well, and she's, she's a good pretender sometimes, but I tell her anyways because I do. And I'm thankful for the time that we've had and will have. I've wit witnessed countless times that mothers first 
look into their baby's eyes. I try to get to the hospital as soon as I can. I don't always make it, and I apologize when I don't, but I try to get to the hospital. I tell people, now call me as soon as the baby's born. Call me or let me know when the baby's been born. I want to be that. I want to be one of those first people. Grandparents, parents first, grandparents, siblings, you know, whatever. But I want to be there. I want, I want to be there. I've got all kinds of pictures at home of me holding those babies. And I love when I walk in that room and that little mother is holding that baby and just staring into their eyes and reading the mind of that little child and I don't some kind of mind meld with them. I don't know, but that, that, that look into that baby's eyes is priceless. I believe perhaps the only way a woman can go through labor more than once is by anticipating that moment of love once again. Ladies, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you go through that labor. That's an intense thing. I, I've never experienced it. I, I never will, and I praise God for it every day. Uh, it's an amazing thing, and, and I guess having, holding, knowing that little baby makes that hard time worthwhile. Knowing Jesus makes that love even stronger. Knowing Jesus Christ as a Savior, and knowing that you have a responsibility of the Savior to raise that child knowing that Jesus loves that child, knowing that Jesus gave his life for that child so that that child one day could know him in that same saving grace that we know him. When you understand how much Jesus loves you, you want to extend that to all, all that you love, but no more importantly than that of your child. A parent who knows Christ and knows the love of Christ wants that child to know the things of Jesus. Most will bring them to Sunday school. And most will take the time to read those childhood bedtime stories. I still remember the book that my parents read from, those little Bible story books. We read them to our kids. We brought them to Sunday school to hear about Jesus and how he loved them and died on the cross. And one of the first songs we teach is, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Easy tune for kids to remember and they, they grasp it very quickly and we raise them in the things of Christ and we come to that time where we hope that they too will receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And What a joy as a parent when that child utters those words, Father, I'm a sinner, please come into my heart and save me. What a joy it was for me to be able to take my children and to uh, take them into the baptismal waters and to, to immerse them in that water to show the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and to testify to the world that that child had received Jesus Christ as their Savior. What a joy it is to hear them as they grow into their teenage years and making decisions in the things of Christ and talking about what the Lord would have them to do. And what an awesome thing it was yesterday to sit around and talk about uh, church services and talk about Christ and what Jesus is doing in our lives and what God's going to do in our families. What a wonderful thing. And if you're here today and you don't have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, could I tell you that today is not too late? Today is a great day to start and say, listen, I want to pass some things on to my family. You can still do that today. But knowing Christ, you know love. And in knowing love, we can share it with others more abundantly. Knowing that Jesus promises eternal life to the souls of mankind. Every parent who knows Christ wants their children to hear, know, and receive that. If your mother asked you to come today, pretty good chance she wants you to hear that. She wants you to hear that message and to know the good things of Christ. Know this, her heart will never be completely at rest till she knows you know Jesus Christ. Never at rest. How sad to think that some have to let a child go and never know their eternal destiny. You can do that. You can receive Christ today if you're not saved right here in this place. At the end of the service, I'm going to give an invitation. I'm going to invite you to come and let someone take a Bible and show you how to be saved today. Hundreds and hundreds of people have done it in this auditorium. Hundreds and hundreds of people at these altars or in these quiet rooms have had someone take a Bible and show them how to be saved and have that hope of eternal life. It's an invitation for you today. Knowing Jesus makes being a parent easier, but demonstrating for us what, tr by, I'm sorry, by demonstrating for us what true love is. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 5 with me. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5. If you buy some today and they don't have a Bible, please share with them. We want you to see that. If you don't have a Bible, let us know and we'll get you one. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Here's the demonstration of love. But ye are therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, 
an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. It was an amazing thing as we talked to this dear lady the other day and uh, told her about Jesus Christ. There came a point in our conversation where tears welled up in her eyes. I said, you're having a hard time understanding and believing that God could love you that much. Yes. Yes. Like many people, the thought was, I, I don't deserve God. I don't deserve Jesus. I said, that's exactly where you need to be, to be able to receive Jesus. I don't deserve Jesus. I don't deserve Jesus Christ. I, I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve God's love. I'm a sinner. I disappointed him, went against him, broke his laws, disobeyed his book. And yet God loves us so much for God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son. To do what? To die on a cross in agony and pain. Why? To pay the penalty of our sins. He died for us. And so we see that love of a parent demonstrated in the love of Christ. How many parents here today, you don't have to raise your hand because I know the answer, but how many of us today would die so that our children could live? Every one of us. Every one of us. There's not a parent here. Zakata's Brother Zakata, if a truck was coming and it was going to hit Jonathan today and kill him, you would push that boy out of the way and you would take that brunt of that hit. I know it. Loves his children. Not a man, not a woman here. Mrs. Yeomans just had that beautiful little baby, Zoe. If, there, if, if Zoe needed a transplant that would save her life if she was sick and Mrs. Yeomans would lose her life to save the life of that child, she would do it. I know it. I know it. That, that's part of being a parent. And God the Father said, I love you so much that I'm going to send a replacement. Really, God himself in the flesh dies so that we can live. That's love. Hey, you want to be a good parent? Know the love of Jesus Christ. It'll show you how to love your children. Amen. Here's the second thing. Good parenting builds with a labor of love. For the, from the moment we received the news that Ruthie had conceived, we immediately transitioned from us to them. Isn't that an amazing thing? It was about us, man. We were having fun five years of being married before we had our first child, Kayla. And man, we're living life. We're doing things. We go where we want, do what we want. Man, we put our money aside for things we want to do. And then she says, we're going to have a baby. <laughs> Everything comes to a screeching halt. And we start thinking about the baby. And then the babies. <laughs> And, and each one brings a new excitement and a, a, a new course and a new need. And our lives are about our children. We gave for them. We, we stayed up for them. We went sleepless nights for them many times. We, we bought things that when, when other things were needed, we bought for them so they'd have, because we love those children. We, we are building with a labor of love. Every day, every dollar, every decision, every dream was with our kids in mind. We both had great lives growing up, but still wanted to give them a little more. Plans were often tempered with, but the kids. We want to do this, but the kids have a ball game, or the kids need new shoes, or, or the kids need a vacation. Homes, trips, education, savings, uh, savings, all of it uh, adjusted for the betterment of the kids. Our labor is a labor of love for our children. And we're glad to do it and have no regret. Why we've even made plans to look after our kids and their kids when we're gone. I told our kids, we, we've got a will. And in that will, we're going to leave our estate to them. If mom and I both go at the same time, everything we have becomes theirs. Nate gets the cufflinks in the Tim Hortons collection. So excited about that. The girls get everything else. But I'm telling you, you sell that Tim Warren stuff, it'll be worth a lot of money. That came so easy to us because we had a great example. It came easy to us to sign those papers and say, if anything happens to us, we're going to pass it all on to our children and, Lord willing, their children. We had a great example. Our parents did the same for us. But even more so, our Savior. Our Heavenly Father created for us this unbelievably beautiful world, and our Savior has, for the past 2,000 years, been building for us a celestial city with a street of gold lined with mansions. We are the children of God, the saved, the redeemed. We're promised an inheritance of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can you imagine being heir to the throne of England or heir to the throne of Spain? 
or those other countries where the monarch still, still lives. We have a Father, a Heavenly Father, who owns all things, a cattle on a thousand hills. And he said that you are the inheritance. We, who are saved, are the inheritance of those things. All that is this world will be ours one day. We are the children of God. He has promised us a life of love and joy and peace and contentment. Are there hardships? Yes. Are there difficulties? Yes. Are there times when we weep? Yes. But intermingled with those and in the greater picture of things, there is a joy unspeakable. And there is an abounding. And there is a hope for even when we lose those loved ones, if they're saved, we know that we will see them again. I often wonder who people see first when they get to heaven. Don't you? Who do they see first? Is it Jesus? Or do our family and friends gather at the gate of that city and say, come in, we're going we're gonna to take you to him. I, I don't know what happens. I, I've envisioned many different ways, and I'll one day find out. But I envision this, that maybe all of our friends and family that we knew here on this earth gather together to meet us. We welcome one another, and then they say, come on, we want to introduce you to somebody. And they take us into that throne room of heaven, and there he is, Jesus, the one we've loved, the one we've served, the one we long for. And we see him. And I don't know if we'll be allowed at that time, but I, I want to run to his feet, and I want to collapse at his feet. I want to kiss the feet of my Savior and say, thank you for giving me the tremendous life you gave me. Thank you for giving me a promise of a home on high. Thank you for letting me get through those days, some days when they're very difficult to know that one day it'll be better. Thank you for giving me the friends and the family and the church that we've got that helped me through those times. Christian life is hard sometimes, and the days are long. Our Father is building a, a labor of love. Sinner without Christ, with only hell in sight, our Father has reserved a place for you, and it's yours for the asking. As a parent myself, I know God's heart desire for you and his child. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Building a future for your children is much easier when you know Jesus. And then finally, good parenting bolsters with legitimacy. I heard it said that when you have a newborn, you're a parent. When your children are 5 to 12, you're a teacher. When your children are 13 to 18, you're a prison guard. And when your kids are 19 to 25, you're a coach. We play many different roles. And we try to do the best we can and don't always do as we should. At every venture of your child's life, they are going to need the truth. And you'd be well to give it to them. They must know the truth. They are seeking the truth. I don't think there's ever been a day in my lifetime of 50, 54 years, I don't know a time in this lifespan when people have desired, wanted, and demanded the truth more than they have right now. And they have access to it. There are a lot of things on the internet that are not truth, but there is a lot of truth on the internet. We can find. We remember how, Some of you remember Encyclopedia Britannica. How many of you had a set of Encyclopedia Britannica? Many of you. Nobody has that anymore. I don't know if they still sell them. I don't know if it's still in existence today. But there were people that used to go door to door and they would sell the Encyclopedia Britannica. And there were, I don't know, 13 or 20 volumes or whatever, these big, thick books. And man, if you had one, you were, you were status if you had Encyclopedia Britannica. And you'd have them in your home and people would use them about once a year. <laughs> and they'd open up those books to try to find the answer to the things. It was, it was an awesome thing. And then came the internet, and all those books were put into a little tiny computer. And you could type it in, and the answer come up. What an amazing thing. Your kids are looking for the truth today. And they need to find it first here. They need to know the truth of this book. This world needs to know the truth of this book. I was asked this week, how do, we, how do we know that this is everything? How do we know that with all the things that have gone on in this world, with all the things that have been written, how do we know that this is the absolute truth? And I said this, by faith. <laughs> by faith. Could you imagine trying to 
to put into the Encyclopedia Britannica or a volume of books all the things that Jesus said and did. The, the Bible itself says there's not enough paper in the world, not enough trees to cut down and make paper to contain all the things that could have been said about Jesus Christ. So God narrows it down, and, and it was well put. This is the Reader's Digest of Jesus Christ. That's a great statement. I thought that was awesome. The Reader's Digest. I, I said, I'm going to preach a message on that. That'd be all right. Yeah, that'd be all right. The Reader's Digest. God condenses it down, the most important part, so that we can grasp it right here in this book. And you know what? You know what this book is all about? Love. It's a love letter. It's a love letter from God that says, I love you so much that I sent my son, and here's why. Because I created a world, and I knew it wasn't going to be perfect, and I knew before I even had that baby that that baby would sin, that that baby would do wrong, that that baby would hurt me, that baby would crush me, that baby would grow and do things I never wanted to do. So before I even had that baby, I made a plan to protect and to save that baby. And his name was Jesus. And we'll start out and I'll have men do a sacrifice of an animal but it won't be good enough and they'll see that and I'll give them a law and it'll show them how much of a sinner they are and, and the sacrifice won't be enough and, and, and I'll give them the prophets to tell them that there's going to come a better sacrifice and then that sacrifice came. Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. His name is Jesus. And Jesus dies on a cross and makes the final sacrifice so that all of mankind might have the hope of eternal life. Before we had our kids, we wanted to think that our kids would be different than any other kids. They would never do wrong. We were going to be the parents of all time. Our kids would not lie. They would not steal. They would not disappoint. And I was so close. And then Ruthie dropped the ball. Oh, you know that's not the truth. We know those kids wouldn't be perfect. Man, we were so excited to have them. We knew there would come a day when they would say something and it would break our hearts. Man, we're so glad to have them. I knew that I'd have to discipline them and it would break my heart, but man, we're so glad to have them. Because we knew that there was a plan. And before we even had them, at one point in their life, we would somehow, some way, give them the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And in knowing Jesus Christ, they would have a new life that would help them through this life. Man, I'm so glad I know Jesus today, aren't you? I'm so glad I've had that love and that example from him. At every venture of our child's life, they're going to need the truth. They'll not always want it or appreciate it, but they are to grow and be successful. They must be able to distinguish what is legitimate and what is not. You will not be the maker by what your children will determine what is, I'm sorry, you will be the marker by what your children will determine what is truth. Children trust their parents. If I say something to a child and they're not sure, what do they do? They look up at their parents. That's the standard. I'll say something outlandish. I kid with the kids at church all the time. I'll say something um, funny to them or whatever. And if they're not sure, the look goes to the parents. And the parents sometimes will make this face. Mm, he's not telling you the truth. And those kids, you're not telling me the truth. No, I'm kidding you. I'm kidding with you. I'm playing with you. That's not the truth. Sometimes mom and dad will do this. That's right. It's the truth. And that child then knows that he can accept that or she can accept that. You are the marker. What have you shown your kids about the truth of life and death? What have you shown your kids the truth of life and eternal life? What truth have you shared with them of this blessed book and the importance of it and the need of it? As a, as a parent today, I urge you, I plead with you to give your children this truth. This, thy word is truth. Described right here, thy word is truth. Amen. This book, I don't trust any other book, but I trust this book. You say, why, preacher? Because having read this book and having memorized this book and having lived this book, I can tell you, it is truth. It's truth. And our kids need it more than ever. Wouldn't it make sense that we find the truth first and then share it with them? 
Could I urge you today, again, to get into this book, to open this book, to study this book, to love this book, to memorize this book, all things this book. Parenting is so much easier when you know Jesus because he is truth and provides all truth for us, and he even put it into a book for us. Every question your child is likely to ask you, is there is an answer to be found in this book right here. John 8, 31 and 32, then, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And know this, and ye shall know the what? Truth and the what shall make you free? The, the truth shall make you free. There are so many that are in bondage today. I think of this young man. He was in bondage to drugs. And so many are in bondage to sin. And so many are in the bondage of hatred. And so many are in the bondage of, of depression and sorrow. And the truth sets us free. When you find Jesus Christ, you find truth. And when you find truth, it sets you free. I don't have to worry about if I die tomorrow, what's going to happen. I don't have to worry about what's my eternal life going to be. I don't have to worry about what does God think. I don't have to worry if I measure up. The answer has all been given to me in this book. It set me free. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, would you? Ephesians chapter 4. Look there with me. Ephesians 4 and verse 11 says this. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which the head even Christ. A lot of lies among men today. There are a lot of deceit among this world today. A lot of things that we can't be sure of. So we who know Christ seek out that truth and then in love share that truth. Could I in love share a truth with you today? God loves you. It's almost unfathomable sometimes for people. God loves you. But you don't understand, preacher. I'm not a very good person. God loves you. But you don't understand what I've done. God loves you. God loved this world. He didn't say, I love the world that's good. I love the world that tries hard. I love the world that loves me. He didn't say that. For God so loved the world, all men, all women, all time. And he gave his son for us. What answers will you give to your children when they ask? And they will. Where is heaven? How do we get there? Why do we or don't we go to church? Why, why do we use the Bible? And what is the Bible? What answers will you give? Your answer is not, if your answer is not the truth, I'm sorry, your answer is not the truth, will do more harm to your children than you could ever imagine. Give them the truth. Knowing Jesus makes parenting so much easier because Jesus has provided the answers for us already. All we have to do is share them with those that we love the most. That's good parenting. Let me ask you today, do you know Jesus? And are you allowing Jesus and his word to help you parent those awesome children that he's given into your care? Today, do you know Christ? Do your children know Christ? Do your grandchildren know Christ? If you're a Christian today, give them Christ. Show them Christ. Talk about Christ. But more importantly, listen to me now. Live Christ. Live Christ. For you to say that I love Jesus and I love the things of Christ and live a hypocritic, hypocritical life will wipe out all the good that you do. So important that we be consistent. I'm glad that I know Jesus. And I'm glad that I have children. I'm glad I've been able to share with them Jesus. I'm glad that they've received him. It makes parenting so much easier. Today, if you're here and you're a parent, 
I want to pray that God helps you be a better parent. We all need it. We all want it. If you're a child here today, I'm going to pray that you listen to the words of your parents if they're speaking the things of Christ. And if you're here today and you're not saved, I'm going to beg and plead with you to come and trust Christ as your Savior so that you can take what you've learned. And maybe you don't even have children, but you could share it with someone else's children. Or you could take it to those that are part of your family that aren't necessarily your children, or maybe a friend not necessarily your children, but you could share with them the truth of God's holy word. We trust you've enjoyed this message preached at the Bible Baptist Church of St. Thomas, Ontario, pastored by Dr. Al Stone. We invite you to be a part of our worship service this Sunday 